Welcome to the Grim Leftovers Show with Grimnir every Monday night at 7 p.m. Eastern on RealLibertyMedia.com and RLMRadio.xyz. Ah, uh, yeah, folks, Monday once again. It is October 28th, 2019. This is episode 45 of the Grim Leftovers program. And uh, glad to have you all here with me today on RealLibertyMedia.com and RLMRadio.xyz. Over there on RealLiberty.org. And if you're tuned in from Internet Radio or TuneIn.com, Shoutcast.com, welcome to you all as well. And uh, anywhere else you may be out there and tuned in and around and alive, good to have you here with me on this day. Oh, boy, I just before the uh, program here, uh, well, about an hour ago, I guess, I uh, come back in here to my computer, and it's nothing. Nothing's going on. And uh, uh, there's something wrong with one of my USB deals. I can't figure it out about one of my USB drivers or the, the bus or something like that. So what i got to do is, is I have a, a thing called Synergy that lets me have one computer work with the other computer's mouse and keyboard. Uh, and normally I use this computer that I'm on, uh, which I've got all my programs and everything set up on for the broadcast to do that. But uh, if the USB thing quits working, uh, then I have to lo go on to the other computer and switch that around and come back over to this computer, shut everything down, turn the computer off, to turn it back on, and it's all okay after that. So I don't know what it is. It's some kind of USB issue, but... I don't like it, and I, I assume it's a uh, uh, something to do with Windows, but I don't know for sure. Anyway, howdy, and welcome to everybody out there listening in, and welcome to all the folks here in the, the chat room on irc.freedo.net via the reallibertymedia.com page or through their own IRC clients, and we always have a great group of folks here hanging out as we do this evening. So let me say hi and howdy to the folks and the bots and bodies, as Flash somebody would say. Uh, we got we got the barman, yes indeed, Mr. Beetle and Cowboy Tech, myself and the, the Moose Girl are here. Yeah, it's okay, Moose. Uh, like I said, I uh, the first time it ever happened, I just shut it down hard and and brought it back up. But uh, I, I learned after that that's not the way to do things. It really messes up all my. Uh, my, my crypto coins when I do that. <laughs> Not to mention other things. Yeah, that that one broke my uh, 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 my my uh, uh, Thunderbird and, and really messed up my email setups. Anyway, we got Anti and Asmo and Chelsea Doty and Echelon and Gram V. Uh, we got the Java Doctor and Hansel, aka Judge Dread, Mister Meister Meister Brow, uh, also known as Woody, the Ponder Gonder. A.K.A. Vin E. Vincent Easley the second there, the Poopster and the Prince. I wonder where Poopster's at. I haven't seen and heard from him for a while. He wasn't here uh, on the last Power Hour last Thursday night. So hopefully you're okay out there, Poopster. Uh, all right, we got Miss Kate with us tonight, and A.K.A. Rome's slash trust no one. A.K.A. Yes, uh, we got the Vanna White Pot in the Weather Dark Pot. And the Woodman himself, yes, indeed, uh, with Phantom and CC66, uh, Crypto Coiner 66. I think that's what, it's, what it stands for. Choskira, who's, uh, well, that's what I wanted to say. The wonderful Miss Circle, the uh, half-human, half-bot cyborg noodle, Miss Dam Van Meter. <laughs> Dan from 10EC, duh. Duh, uh, yeah, duh, we like duh, that's cool, man. Uh, we got E-Man and n and Frumpy, the F-Man, Goober, Goober, <laughs> be good, Goober, Gromit and JJ's from Scotland, uh, yes, indeed, uh, the Mr. Snick and the, the real Donny Woo, Mr. Sock Puppet himself, SLC Mike, how's it going out there in Utah, Mike, uh, Smartass and the Holiest of Rogers, and finally, uh, lastly in the list, Mr. Zipix. Zipix, all these wonderful folks hanging out here in the chat with us tonight. Uh, good to have you all here and hanging around. Yeah, man. <laughs> anyway, I got a bunch of stories lined up for you. Uh, 
bunch of old stories lined up for you, I should say, because that's what we do here on the Leftovers program, the Grim Leftovers. And we'll just go ahead and get started. I, I can't think of anything else I really need to tell you about or talk to you about. I think everything else is cool and good and ready to go. Yeah, 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 yeah. All right, good. Good enough. So from ArsTechnica.com here, posted on September 14th. Trampoline mirror, <laughs> which sounds funny. Trampoline mirror may push laser pulse through fabric of the universe. That doesn't sound good. <laughs> Simply charging a mirror may allow physicists to poke a hole in the universe. Are you guys sure you want to do that? Is that something you really think you might want to do? Because I'm thinking that sounds like something, you know, theoretically, check it out. But uh, in practice, just let's just let's just hold off on that one. Let's not do that. Scientists want to rip the universe apart. At least that is what a Daily Mail headline might read. Lasers can now reach a power in the petawatt range. And when you focus a laser beam that powerful, nothing survives. All matter is shredded, leaving only electrons and nuclei. But laser physicists haven't stopped there. Under good experimental conditions, the very fabric of space and time are torn asunder, testing quantum electrodynamics to destruction, and a new mirror may be all we need to get there. Eh, really, guys? <laughs> really? <laughs> On average, the amount of power used by humans is around 18 terawatts, a petawatt, is a thousand times larger than a than a terawatt. The baddest laser on the planet currently currently produces somewhere between five and ten petawatts. There are plans on the drawing board to reach a hundred petawatts in the near future. The trick is that the power is not available all the time. Each of these lasers produces somewhere between five and five thousand. Uh, joule, joules of energy. It just says J there. I had to think for a second. Joules of energy for a very, very short time between a picosecond and 10 to the negative 12 seconds. Uh, and, and, and a few femtoseconds or 10 to the negative 15 seconds. During that instant, however, the power flow is immense. Yes. Numbers beyond 42. The numbers get even more mind-blowing when you consider that all of that energy is focused, such that it intens the intensities reach something like 10 to the 22nd watts per centimeter squared. To put this in perspective, you can start creating a plasma when, it, when the intensity hits 10 to the 12 watts per centimeter squared. Once the intensities get above 10 to the 25th watt per centimeter squared, if the light hits just a single electron, there's enough energy to start a cascade of electron-positron production out of the vacuum. If the laser intensity were to hit 10 to the 29th watt centimeter squared, not even a single electron is required, the light will rip virtual electrons out of the vacuum, generating real charges from apparent nothingness in space. Luckily, I say luckily, getting to 10 to the 25th uh, watts per centimeter squared is tough. The issue is one material, or rather, it's the lack of a material, that can survive long enough to focus the laser light. This is where plasma mirrors come in. Plasma mirrors were all the rage a few years ago when petawatt lasers were all fresh and new. The idea is actually very simple. A plasma gas of conducting particles with its electrons being very light and easy to move around 
when the light hits the plasma, the electrons are accelerated back and forth following the light's electric field. In doing so, the electrons absorb and re-emit the light in the opposite direction. In other words, the light reflects from the plasma just like it does from a chrome bumper. The plasma is basically already uh, as destroyed as material can be, so the l laser beam cannot damage the plasma. It was initially thought, initially, that the plasma mirrors could not act as a good focusing element. Uh, essentially, it's impossible to get the shape right, but 24 hours of supercomputer time has shown that a plasma mirror just might be the right way to go. New developments in the model code allowed researchers to simulate a full 3D laser pulse impacting on a surface. Researcher Henry Vincenti, those damn Vincentis, uh, from France, has taken advantage of these new computational developments to adapt this code to open up new ways to increase the intensity of some very bright lasers. In his model, the surface was placed at an angle to a laser beam. The laser beam has an intensity profile that has the highest in the center and fades off to the outside. To combine the intensity profile with the angle of the surface, the plasma generated by the laser pulse forms a relatively smooth elliptical shape. This means that the light reflected from the plasma will focus to a well-defined point. That's nice, but what follows is even better, or ultimately worse, depending on your perspective. I mean, if you really want the universe torn asunder, I suppose it's better. But if you don't, yeah, maybe not. <laughs> anyway, as the light intensity gets really high, as uh, probably some of those here listening are, really high, the collective motion of the electron starts to look a bit like a motion on the woofer of a speaker. The light is essentially hitting the surface that is vibrating super fast. That motion Doppler shifts the light to the higher frequencies, like the siren on an approaching ambulance. The incident beam of red light will be reflected with a strong blue and ultraviolet components. The way the mirror oscillates also means that the light frequencies are all multiples of each other. The mirror reflects all of these colors together, and they add up to a pulse that is even shorter in time. In fact, the pulse goes from being uh, 20 femtoseconds in a duration to uh, 0 0.1 femtoseconds, uh, which a femtosecond, in case you're unaware, is 10 to the negative 15 seconds. That's not much time. <laughs> yes, you are a Vincente. <laughs> this, by itself, increases the intensity by a factor of 100. The shorter wavelength also means that the light focuses to a smaller spot. The end result is a factor of 1,000 higher intensity for the same input laser and a simple mirror swap. That's pretty cool. In theory. <laughs> Will it work in reality? They say I think so, and I'm saying I hope not. The code to model high-power laser pulses hitting the stuff is pretty good now. The technical details are not too challenging using a low-power terawatt laser pulse to create the mirror and then to hit it with everything you've got a few picoseconds later the bread and butter to a high-power laser lab. Then, of course, they can all stare and wonder at the hole they made. I, I, I don't want you guys doing this. I know it's all fascinating, and it would just be awesome to look at if you don't actually tear the universe apart. Yeah, I, I, I'm thinking this is a bad idea. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not behind you on this. I like science. I like scientific experimentation as much as the next guy. But when it comes down to doing these kind of things, when you have the possibility of tearing the universe asunder, <laughs> I'm going to go ahead and say, 
No. No. Don't do that. <laughs> All right. Let's come back to Earth for a moment for something uh, truly disgusting. Because, all right, I, I don't know about you. I, I mean, when I was six years old, I didn't think about any kind of sexual things. I mean, I knew I had a penis that I used to go to the bathroom with. That's all that I thought or knew it was for. I didn't have any other purpose in my mind at six years old. Maybe some of you did. I don't know. Maybe some of you were doing what they're teaching kids to do now. I don't like it. I, I, I think it's wrong. Uh, anyway, from the DailyMail.com here, posted up on uh, 21st of September. Children as young as six years old are to be given compulsory self-touching lessons that the critics are, say are sexualizing youngsters. And I agree. As I said, six years old, no clue. Didn't want no clue. Didn't have no clue. I was... You know, girls were the cootie things. I didn't want to mess it around with six, you know, at six years old, and and certainly there was no whacking off at six years old because it didn't work at that age. There was no, <laughs> there was no excitation factor involved. <laughs> anyway, the lessons are part of the controversial all about me teaching program. All About Me is being rolled out across 241 primaries in Warwickshire County Council. Campaigners warn that inappropriate sexual material could be given to children. You think? Children as young as six years old are being taught about touching or stimulating their own genitals as part of a class that will become compulsory in hundreds of primary schools. Why? Why are you doing this? <laughs> Some parents and other people of logical brains believe the lessons, a part of the controversial new sex and relationship teaching programs called All About Me, are sexualizing their children very much too young. <sighs> One couple told last night how they were so disturbed that they withdrew their sons from lessons at the school where the program is already being taught. All About Me is being rolled out across 241 primaries in Warwickshire County Council and could be adopted by other local authorities next year as part of the government's overhaul of relationship and sex education. At a six years old, that was first grade. Uh, well, it wasn't my, my, my area of the world. It was first grade. Kindergarten was, was five years old. And first grade was six. I, no, I, I, no, 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 no. <laughs> anyway, the family campaigners and religious groups warned that vague guidelines issued by the Department for Education meant schools could soon be providing sexual material to young children that many parents would consider inappropriate. Even politicians who had supported the RSE legislation expressed concern. Tory MP David Davey said, I and many other parents would be furious at completely inappropriate sexual matters being taught to children as young as six. These classes go way beyond the guidance that government is producing and are effectively sexualizing very young children. It is ridiculous, Moose Girl. I, 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 I can't, I mean, I can't fathom what these people are thinking to want to make this happen. It, 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 it seems like uh, some people, and it's not obviously not just one person. There's got to be a group of people to make this go on. Uh, these people are are there's something wrong with them. There's they're not mentally right, and they're the ones teaching the children and setting the the agenda for what children will learn. I, I don't know. Anyway, documents obtained by the Mail on Sunday detail 
detail how All About Me classes involve pupils aged between 6 and 10 being told by teachers that there are rules about touching yourself. An explanation of the rules about self-stimulation appears in the scheme's uh, year two lesson plan for six and seven years old. Now, the kids, do kids, I mean, maybe kids are different these days, I don't know, but do, are, are, <laughs> do, can you actually get excited at that age? I, I don't know. It says, however, the youngsters are warned, and I think this is at least good, youngsters are warned that it's not polite to touch themselves in public. <laughs> it, it is an activity that they should do a, when alone in the bath, shower, or bed. <laughs> so if these kids had never even thought about this or considered it, or, or it never crossed their mind, they now will at a much younger age. They will now consider, hey, we learned how to do this in school. Let's give it a whack. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> I don't understand. I, I just don't get it. What is wrong with people? Let kids grow up a little bit. Let them get to 12, 13 years old. I don't know what the ages are. 11, maybe. Uh, at least before, you know, and they say, hey, what's going on down here in my pants? And, and then you then you can teach them stuff. But, I mean, come on. <laughs> it's fucking crazy. Oh, man. All right. From the madnesshub.com on September 22nd. Now, I... I I've never been a like a religious style person. I've never been a big uh, kind of religious folk, um, and I have obviously never been to a seminary school or anything like that. But I have read a lot of things about not just the church and the Catholic Church, as I was baptized as a Catholic, uh, but also on this craziness called man-made climate change or global warming, or other such things. But I do know that the two don't go together. They really don't. However, seminary students offer confessions to plants in ritual. <laughs> All right. <laughs> It says the left has taken the climate change to a whole new and bizarre level. Students at the seminary school in New York recently held a religious religious ritual in which they confessed sins to plants. They confessed sins to plants. <laughs> yes, really. <laughs> the College Fix reported, Seminary defends confessing sins to plants. Beautiful, moving ritual. Yeah, students at a seminary in New York City recently confessed their sins to plants during a chapel service. Now, I don't know if the uh, plants are able to uh, give them admonitions and, uh, uh, <laughs> and, and uh, forgive their sins if they do 12 Hail Marys or whatever the heck they do. Uh, I'm pretty sure they can't, though. Not not even moving plants like your Venus flytrap or nothing. But uh, you want to go ahead and confess your sins to a plant. Okay. An experience that drew nationwide ridicule, but that a campus spokesman defended as a beautiful move, moving ritual in a statement to the college fix. On Tuesday, Union Theological Seminary in Manhattan shared on its Twitter account a photo of a group of students speaking to an arrangement of houseplants. Now, my question to them is this. I mean, if they're so all fired up about these plants, why do they have them in cages? I mean, they're houseplants. They're, that means they're probably in pots of some kind, right? That's, you know, that's a cage, isn't it? 
They're not out there in the wild. Anyway, today in chapel, we confess to plants. Together, we held our grief, joy, regret, hope, guilt, and sorrow in prayer, offering them to the beings who sustain us, but whose gift we too often fail to honor. According to the website, Union Theological Seminary was founded in 1836 by nine Presbyterian ministers who were seeking a new vision for theological education. Long known as a center of progressive Christian theology, it has graduated and hosted liberal thinkers from Harry Fosdick to Cornel West. Elsewhere on its website, it states that the fragility of our planet is one of the most profoundly challenging issues of contemporary experience. They got a bunch of tweets here showing you the various stuff. And it guarantees you, it swears to you, this is not a parody. This actually freaking happened. <laughs> so, if you uh, if you feel the urge, yeah, go to your house plants, or maybe the plants in your yard. I I don't know, whatever works for you, and uh, and and confess your sins. To your plants and also give them praise and i would say giving them praise is a good way i mean talking to your plants we all know that works well i don't we all know but it does work uh talking to your plants does work in order to get them to uh rise up and grow and feel healthy yes nuttery nuttery to the <laughs> extreme <laughs> rob works welcome to the show oh boy well here's a slight bit of good news. Not that this should need to be good news. This should be normal news. But it's a slight bit of good news in today's world, in the way things work today. On the freethoughtproject.com, posted September 21st, no charges for dad who shot two cops to protect his daughter from an unlawful raid on his home. As I said, it shouldn't be necessary for this to be good news. It should be normal, the way things work news. But in today's world, it's, it's good news. District Heights, Maryland. A team of police officers who were serving a search warrant at the wrong house encountered an armed father who was trying to pre protect his daughter from what he believed were intruders. Well, they were intruders. <laughs> During a news conference on the incident, George's County Police Chief Hank Stanwinski uh, admitted that a nine-member special operations team went to the apartment when they say served a search warrant around 10.30 p.m. on a Wednesday. A law-abiding, hard-working citizen and his daughter were at were home at the point when uh, where we began to execute that search warrant. Stanwinski said, "The police chief claims the warrant was originally granted because a confidential informant told officers that a drug dealer was living at the residence. This was not a pharmacy." Our, our officers had worked to corroborate the information from that confidential informant. However, we did not draw the right conclusion, <laughs> you think? According to a report from NBC Washington, when officers arrived at the home, they announced their presence and then used a device to open the door. They said, pigs, and then they bashed the door in with a battering ram. Uh, that's what they mean, announced and uh, used the device. It's not clear whether they used the battering ram, yes it is, to break down the door, or if they threw flashbang grenades inside the home to startle the residents. They probably did that too. Uh, when the officer broke down the door, they encountered a man who was holding a shotgun. He fired a single shot, which Stan Winsky claimed hit two of the officers who were trying to break into the man's home. However... When the man realized the intruders were the pigs, uh, police officers, as they say here, he dropped his weapon and begged them not to shoot his daughter. As that door, 
As that door now opens, he realizes that those are police officers. He immediately drops a weapon. He immediately goes to the window and starts communicating, You've got the wrong address. Don't shoot my daughter. While one of the officers returned fire, being the terrible aims that they always are, no one was hit. And the officers who were shot by the homeowner uh, are in stable condition which is a miraculous ending to what could have been a tragic scene. Easily, easily. Because the police admitted that they attempted to serve a search warrant at the wrong home, because they acknowledged that any attempt to press charges against an innocent man could result in a costly lawsuit, and likely because no one was killed during the incident, Stan Winsky confirmed that no charges would be filed against the man who shot the officers. So that's a little bit of fun there. You get to shoot a couple of cops and uh, nothing happens. <laughs> the investigation corroborates his account that he did not know they were police officers trying to enter his residence. I believe that and I know that to be true, Stan Winsky said. The police chief also admitted that his department needs more training. Yeah, how about I just get some smarter people instead of these freaking ADIQ morons. Uh, when determining search warrants and deciding uh, to break into houses based on rumors from con confidential informants. I'm not satisfied that we had done enough to corroborate the information we had in the obtaining of the warrant, he said. <laughs> oh, if this weren't just so common in every in everyday kind of happenstance, you know... But it is. And just over and over again, they got bad warrants, bad information from bad sources. And they Not only that, but even after that, they break into the wrong houses. They shoot people, animals. They don't care. And then they do bad things to the people that survive. So, as I said, a little bit of good news and something that should not need to be good news. It should just be the way it is. You break into my house, I shoot you. I defend myself in any manner I have available to me. That should be what happens. And nothing else should happen beyond that, except to those people that were breaking into your house. Those thugs. Alright. I'm going to sip of water here. Ah. Alrighty, alright. From What's Up With That? <laughs> Posted September 1st, 2019. The next great extinction event will not be global warming. It will be global cooling. That's according to this guy, Alan M. R. McRae who's B-A-S-C-M-E-N-G. I don't know what all those letters mean, but uh, he's got all those letters following his name. Rob Works just posted a link there in the chat that I'm not going to be able to get to here. But uh, he says that cops tell man to put his hands up. He does, and then they kill him anyway. And that was posted from today, so hooray. <laughs> All right, catastrophic global warming is a false crisis, as I've stated again and again and again on this show and Freaker's Ball and anywhere else I could throw my voice. The next great extinction will be global cooling. Maybe, maybe. I mean, it's good to say that and it's good to think that, I guess, but maybe. How about we go with the next great extinction event might possibly be global cooling. Yeah. Forget all those falsehoods about the scary global warming deceptions contrived by wolves to stampede the sheep, stampede the sheep. The next great extinction event will not be global warming. Future extinction events are predominantly cold. A glacial period, medium-sized asteroid strike, or super volcano. I'm thinking... Uh, EMP, probably an EMP, could could do us in pretty good. A good enough, well-directed EMP from the sun. You know, that big 
thing that goes up in the sky every day, shines light and warmth down upon you, that thing, yeah, it's got a lot of power. And it could wipe us out in an instant. It wouldn't even think about it. It's not, it doesn't have any grudges. It don't care. <laughs> anyway, humanity barely survived the last glacial period that ended only 11,500 years ago. The blink of an eye in geological time. Cold, not heat, is by far the greater killer of humanity. Today, cool and cold weather kills about 20 times as many people as warm and hot weather. Excess winter deaths defined as more deaths in, in four winter months uh, than equivalent non-winter months total over 2 million souls per year in both cold and warm climates. Earth is colder than optimum for humanity and currently observed moderate global warming increases uh, in warming increases lifespans. Yeah, cold weather kills 20 times as many people as hot weather. Just, just for stats, if you need them. However, excess winter deaths are not the worst threat to humanity. The glacial cycle averages about 100,000 years, consisting of about 90,000 years of the glacial period. So you get 10,000 odd years there between glacial periods. When the mile-thick continental glaciers blanketed much of the northern and southern hemispheres, including Canada, Russia, northern Europe, and northern USA, and about 10,000 years of interglacial, the warm period, which we're presently in, uh, and Earth is now 11,500 years into the warm interglacial, which means that we're slightly overdue, about 1,500 years overdue in this uh, current warm period for uh, the next glacial period. The, re the re-entry into the glacial period will be a major extinction event for humanity. To some degree. I mean, there's still going to be some places to be able to survive. It won't be any fun. A lot of people will die. A lot of crops will die off. A lot of bad other things will happen. But there will be ways. There'll be ways. I mean, everybody won't die. So, uh, it's just something to think about, though. Um, yeah, these global warming wackadoos, um, climate change wackadoos, uh, the, the Greta followers, all those folks. Anyway, there's a lot more to that article that I'm not going to go into. Um, I will get, give you the conclusion. The paper discusses real threats, specifically global cooling including imminent moderate global cooling and later re-entry into another glacial period in order to shift the climate discussion from the popular scary fantasies of runaway global warming to cold events that actually do threaten the human uh, future of humanity and the environment. Uh, there, there is a link to a PDF on this document posted in here and other such things, all kinds of links to all kinds of data to back up all of the, in, uh, the, the stuff that he talks about here. In, uh, not that kind, Mike. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> oh. Anyway, <laughs> let me give it a sip of water. <laughs> mm. Anyway, you know that one of the biggest expenditures of your tax dollars, your tax, the money stolen from you on a periodic basis, weekly, monthly, annually, longer, whatever, the, the, they call them tax dollars, and they're stolen from you by various city, uh, county, state, and federal governments. All, all those people steal, steal money from you. And some of that money is used to supposedly uh, pay for things that are that the federal government budgets for, although most of it goes to pay interest on loans of fake money that was printed by the global central banking cartel, of which the U.S. part is the Federal Reserve. Um, 
yeah, they print fake money and then they charge you interest on it. And they get real stuff back for their fake money. Anyway, um, so, so most of your tax dollars actually go to that. However, they say, no, no, these are your tax dollars that work over here. And the biggest part of that, the biggest share of that, is for the Department of Defense, the War Department. And what do you think they're doing with all that money? Well, I'll tell you. <laughs> On Reason.com from uh, July 3rd here. <laughs> Defense Department Computer Network among the top sharers of child pornography. Oh yeah, I'm so glad that my tax dollars are paying for so, so we got these pervs in the Department of Defense viewing child pornography. <laughs> oh man, <laughs> yeah. Defense Department computers are among the top distributors, not just viewers, distributors of child porn. An untold number of Department of Defense employees and contractors have subscriptions to child pornography websites, and the problem is apparently so pervasive it requires new technical solutions to address it. Hundreds of DOD-affiliated individuals were recently identified as suspects in child pornography cases, according to an investigation by the Defense Criminal Investigation Service. So far, authorities have only looked into about 20% of these cases, but already they found several individuals using government devices to download or share pornographic material. Last year, the investigation by the National Criminal Justice Training Program found that DOD computers were among the top networks nationwide for peer-to-peer -peer sharing of pornographic images of minors. DOD's network ranked 19th out of 2,891 computer networks studied. To prevent such widespread abuse going forward, the and National Defense Network Abuse Act, they've got to actually make a law to get their people to stop sharing child porn. So the, Na the End National Defense Network Abuse Act would crack down on this activity by upgrading the training and technical capacity of military criminal investigative organizations to confront the misuse of DOD computers, facilities, and equipment. According to a press release, anyhow, it would also arrange for DOD authorities to work more closely with civilian law enforcement on these cases. The notion that the DOD's network and Pentagon-issued computers may be used to view, create, or circulate such horrifying images is a shameful disgrace and one we must, we must fight head on, said Representative Abigail Spanberger, who co-sponsored the bill with Rep. Mark Meadows. <sighs> a companion bill in the Senate has been introduced by Senators Lisa Murkowski uh, and Brian Schatz. Brian Schatz is pants. All right. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Sock puppet says that's certainly under the guise of doing by. It's part of doing by government job. <laughs> yeah, he's doing a job, all right. <laughs> oh man, <laughs> cowboy tech, who's a uh, technician, computer technician, goes around fixing people's computers there in his local area, says the most infected machine he ever comes across, and a large part of his job is uh, removing viruses from people's computers. So the most infected computer he's seen was in City Hall. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> All right, RussiaInsider.com. Posted up on September 30th, the BRICS, if you're not familiar with the BRICS, the BRICS is a big financial group designed to pretty much offset the dollar, the U.S. dollar. 
Oh, I'll get into that in a minute. But it's basically it's brush Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa. BRICS, B-R-I-C-S. Maybe not in that order, but it fits well in, in the little acronym there. So um, anyway, BRICS will soon, whatever that means, soon, account for more than half of the world's economy. BRIC economies are set to expand by about 20% over the day. Oh, did I lose connection? It looks like I lost connection. Sorry, guys. I don't know what happened there, but I, I see my connection dropped out for a moment. I guess you will be hearing this in a minute or two. Um, so uh, when it comes back, I'll get back to this whole BRICS thing. It It burped. It burped on me. I don't know what happened. I don't know what happened. All right. All right, so the BRICS will soon account for more than half of the world's economy. The combined economies of the BRICS member states, Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa, are set to expand by about 20% in roughly a decade. Russian finance minister Anton Sulianov has announced. So if he's right, good. The BRICS country's economy today accounts for a third of the global economy. According to conservative estimates, by 2030, the economies will make up more than half of the world's economy, Suleyulyunov said at the BRICS International Competition Conference on, uh, in Moscow. Members of the alliance continue to work on eliminating trade barriers between them and can set example for other countries. BRICS was established in 2006 by Brazil, Russia, India, China, and before South Africa joined the bloc in 2010 uh, and adding the S to the acronym. So as of 2018, a combined nominal GDP of these five emerging econom economies amounted to around $18.6 trillion per year. In line with efforts to boost trade, members are working uh, the integration of payment systems, increasing payments in national currencies, as well as the establishment of an independent channel on information exchange. It was earlier reported that BRICS uh, states are set to create a new joint payment system called BRICS Pay that will be similar to existing Apple Pay or Samsung Pay services. So, yeah, some kind of digital payment service there. Anyway, cooperation in terms of developing the use of our national currencies and international settlements seems very promising, said the poot, pooty poot, uh, in June as he met BRICS leaders ahead of the G20 summit. So, to me, it's like whatever it takes, what, what, you know, whatever, whatever matters, in order Uh, to 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 uh, to get rid of the dollar. Uh, Moose Girl wants to know if I know if you can convert BRICS, which is B R I C S, not X S, because uh, the C is China. Um, anyway, uh, to to dollars. So uh, you can convert any currency to any other currency. It don't matter what it is. It'll go on a foreign exchange, and 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 on that exchange you can swap. Anything for anything. It don't matter what, what what currency you got. You can swap it one for the other. So uh, I don't know that they actually have that form of payment set up yet uh, available to everybody. And that's kind of like, you know, the, the, the World Bank and these SDRs. I don't think those are available for the general public. Uh, you can't just go out and buy SDRs, uh, which are... Uh, I forget the name, what, 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 the, what they mean exactly. But, the, but that's their form of payment. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, it, one, if they ever become available, uh, not to, to just uh, at the government level, but, but at, the, at the personal private level, then, then at that point you will definitely be able to trade uh, back and forth with whatever other currencies are available on, on the currency exchanges. Uh, and that includes Bitcoin at this point, or uh, maybe some other cryptocurrencies. Like I said, whatever, it depends. Each exchange has the right to include or not include 
whatever currencies they want. But generally, they want to be as inclusive as possible in order to get the most money in trading back and forth on those currencies. All right. Now, I don't know if you have any pine trees in your yard. I have several special drawing rights. Thank you very much, Kate. I appreciate it. That's the SDR, the uh, World Bank SDR. Uh, yeah, it's been a while. I haven't talked about the SDRs for a few years. Um, <laughs> haven't needed to. I haven't seen it even mentioned out there. But, uh, yeah, they, they that was their deal. Um, okay, so in my yard, I have I have some big, big pine trees and several of them. Five, five or six of them, I don't know. But I've got some really big ones, 30, 40 feet tall, and some shorter ones, 25 or whatever feet tall. And and they're separated, you know, spread out around the yard. Uh, but in the front are my big ones. And what they do, what those pine trees do, is they shed things. Two things. Pine needles and pine cones. Now... To me, they're a pain in the ass. I don't like them. They're all over the place, these freaking pine needles. But apparently, there's a bunch of uses for your pine needles. In this article here on DIY Natural, has 15 ideas, 15 great ways to get rid of your pine needles. And I'll just kind of breeze through them here. Make a homemade natural soap with pine essential oil and pine needles. Uh, it says pine is naturally antibacterial, and of course it smells great. Uh, pine needles under under acid-loving plants, such as holly or azalea, uh, don't forget the blueberry plants love the acid too, because there is a lot of acid in those pine needles. Not much grows underneath a pine tree. Uh, so you can make a tea out of the pine needles. Uh, you can use the... Uh, I, I don't ask me about this. It's what it says here. It says... Pine needles, especially longer ones, tend to knit themselves together, using them in thick layer on a hill for mulch. All right. Um, so you place some pine needles in your winter garden, which is coming up, to keep moles in voles. So it keeps uh, whatever rodents out of there, I guess, winter rodents. Um, you can, if you didn't use a preservative, you can make tea from the pine needles and drink it, which... It says they have a lot of vitamin C, but all pines do. Uh, you can also make a tincture from the pine needles. Um, See, so cover the needles with vodka and in a sunny spot for a few weeks. Shake it to release more of the oils. Um, yeah, that's just more vitamin C stuff. Make a foot bath. Uh, I'll let you read the rest of this list for yourself. There's a bunch of stuff you can do with pine needles, so you don't just have to always um, throw them out like I've been doing for years. <laughs> and they're a mess. Let me tell you, they're a freaking mess. But, you know, um, check it out. Make an incense out of them. Grind them up. Put, uh, throw, them in your, throw them in your fire, in, in your fireplace. Whatever you like, really. Yeah. <laughs> Whiskey does not taste like vodka. That This is true. <laughs> oh, man. All right. Disclosed TV. This is an old article, but the news may still be new to you. You may not know this. This is posted on January 30th, 2017. So uh, beware. Or you may be a pod person soon. Scientists think this mysterious organism is a seed sent by aliens. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Professor Milton Wainwright and his team, made up of students and staff at the University of Sheffield and the University of Buckingham Center for Astrobiology, discovered several particles of an origin that is not known to this Earth by sending up what is called a sampler balloon into the highest reaches of inner space that a gas-filled balloon can reach, and then reel it back down after it has been up there for a sufficient amount of time to collect minor space debris carried in the wind. 
a microscopic alien seed, has scientists confused. Professor Milton claims that these methods have also turned up particles of the same asteroid that collided with Earth millions of years ago and wiped out the dinosaurs. The disturbing thing about one of the particles discovered clinging to the balloon, now being dubbed the directed panspermia, was that upon inspection at the cellular level showed one of the particles collected was oozing out a biological liquid from what appeared to be a shell made up of an elemental mixture of titanium and vandium. This wasn't the first time such a foreign alien particle was discovered by similar methods of sampling outer space, such as the ghost particle or the dragon particle. While there was also a report of an alien particle found clinging to the Texas-49 rocket uh, that was able to withstand being burned at over a thousand degrees Celsius, There are many different theories on what this could be, with some of the more sinister theories being that it is from an alien origin intended to infect humans with harmful diseases or to seed the world with an alien life form for either good reason or bad reason. One can only hope that there is a simpler and less confrontational reason for this amazing finding because of the astonishing statements made by Professor Milton and his team, NASA is currently preparing their own collection balloon to send into outer space to verify or disprove the claims. Which, I don't know how you're going to verify or disprove the claims just because you may not find the same particle. That's not going to prove or disprove anything. Uh... Yeah, yeah, panspermia. Panspermia. It's one word. It's not two words. (laughs) Anyway. So you may all be pod people. You may already all be pod people for all I know. I I, I don't know. I mean, it seems likely that we have at least one pod person here in the chat. Possibly two. Maybe more that we don't know about because, you know... Pod people get a little trickier as the further they go along. Um, (laughs) Now this, of a more recent nature, 26 days ago, posted on RT.com, because maybe they're coming down to check on how well their pods did in infecting humans and taking over the human race. Yeah. Alien, uh, RT.com. (laughs) <laughs> 2nd of October uh, alien probes spying on earth scientists warn of possible lurkers in our solar system yes is the earth under the watchful eye of lurking extraterrestrial spy probes one US physicist argues that while it's a distant pop- possibility It would not hurt to send out probes of our own to take a look and make sure. Physicist at the independent, yeah, right, independent, SETI, uh, researcher James Bedford, posited that nearby asteroids that track the Earth's orb, track with the Earth's orbit, also known as co-orbitals, would make the ideal place for an otherworldly spy post. He published his findings titled, Looking for Lurkers. Now, we also have those here in the chat. Yes, we, besides the pod people, we also have lurkers here in the chat. So that was in the peer-reviewed Astronomical Journal last month. A probe located nearby uh, could bide its time while our civilization developed technology that could find it and once contacted could undertake a conversation in real time. Sure, it could. It could have been routinely reporting back on our biosphere and civilization (laughs) for long eras. Yes, yes. (laughs) 
Oh, man. <laughs> so there you have it. <laughs> we not only got alien pods trying to make pod people out of the humans, but we got alien lurker spies out there lurk spying on the alien pod people ciggies. <laughs> all right, that's going to wrap it up, folks. Thank you all for tuning in. I've had a fun time sharing the news as it is with y'all. I'm telling you, man, it's a messed up world. It is a messed up world. Uh, anyway, so <laughs> I'll be back next Monday with more of this stuff for ya. And um, then again on Friday night uh, with uh, Freaker's Ball, Balls to the Wall, whatever you want to call it. Moose Girl's out of town to, to go to Horseshoes and Hand Grenades uh, music concert. Uh, so, so I'll be there on Friday. Uh, check on the, tomorrow on RLM Radio for a Slash Somebody and probably Vincent Easley there. Um, ba, 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 ba. What else? What else? What else? Just check the schedule on RealLibertyMedia.com for all the rest of the shows and stuff that come up through the week. And we'll talk to you all later. Have yourselves a good night, a good week. Peace!